Greetings, church family and friends. It has been a long time since we've been able to meet in person, but we want you all to know that we are thinking about everyone and that we've been praying for one another. We thought it was time to share some updates with all of you. You know, we used to get a bulletin each week when we would come out to church, and that would keep us up to date on what's happening. But without us meeting each week or having a bulletin, we wanted to find another way to reach our church family with, with our news. We have had some very exciting things happening. Despite all the shutdowns and everything that's been going on, the Lord is still working on people's hearts. And we would like to take a moment and give a warm welcome to our newest church members, Keith Corbett and Kim McDonald, who were recently baptized into our church family. What a blessing this has been. And some of you may know this, but it's been in the works for quite some time now, where the Caribou Central Church and our church have found a way to work together to support our church school. And we praise the Lord that our first joint school board meeting took place on January 21st, and it was a success. Andrew Nichols, Lucas Kafuk, and Helena Holloway had accepted a call to serve on the school board, and we will be filling one more position in the near future. I'm sure many of you have heard about our media project, which has been promoted since November of this last year. It is now 90% completed to date, and we want to give thanks to all who have donated and participated in this project. We praise the Lord that we're going to be able to use media to broadcast our services and reach others who may not choose to come to an actual physical church building or for those that are unable to. God is so good. And speaking of media, there is something that each of you could do to help reach others with the gospel. And that is for you to subscribe to the Williams Lake Seventh-day Adventist YouTube channel. We need to reach 100 subscribers. We're about halfway there, so we need your help. All you have to do is find our channel on YouTube, Williams Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church, and hit the subscribe button. It's that easy, and there's no cost. And as soon as we hit that 100 subscriber mark, we will be able to broadcast live on YouTube. One other thing, I would like you to mark your calendars for March the 6th for two reasons. First of all, we're going to have a communion service. You ask, how are we going to do that when we can't meet together? Well, God has opened a way for us to have a communion service via Zoom and for us to participate in our own homes. And it can be a real blessing. The church will be providing at-home communion emblems for you to pick up at the church at an arranged time or for someone to deliver them to your home. If you would like to participate in this service, please let our pastor know or any one of our elders or myself and we will make sure that you receive the emblems before March the 6th. The service will be via Zoom, and it will be conducted the same way it usually is, where the pastor will start giving a message, and then we are going to break for foot washing, which we will do in our own homes, and then the pastor and the elders will serve at the communion table and we will participate at home. I'm very excited about this, as um, Mark and I got to experience this last year while we were in Alberta, and it was really a tremendous blessing. The second reason I want you to mark your calendar for March the 6th is we plan to have a church business meeting, commencing at 6 o'clock, again via Zoom, for all the Williams Lake church members. 
There is some church business matters that just need to be dealt with, and so we ask that you please plan to attend if you can. There is going to be an email sent out to the church members with the Zoom link information, as well as that applies for the communion service. There will be an email sent out um, with the Zoom link. Our evangelistic team has been working on a 2021 calendar of events and projects, and they are hoping to let us know soon what that will entail. So we need to pray for our church's vision and mission to be fulfilled. We're also currently working on a new church directory. So just wanting to give you a heads up that we may be contacting you to confirm your current up-to-date information. The Lord is so good, and we have much to be thankful for, despite everything that's going on with COVID. Let's reach out one to another, and let's support each other. Let's pray for one another. This can be a very difficult time for some. Many people are feeling lonely and depressed. There are so many hurting people out there. I just want to take a moment and share um, an experience that, that I had yesterday. I had come home from work, and I quickly had to run into town, so I ran down the Dog Creek Road hill there and down towards the bottom of the hill. On the opposite side, I saw a young man standing on the side of the road. And he looked cold, but I thought, oh, maybe he's waiting for a ride home after school. I wasn't sure. Um, but I just thought he looked really cold. I went to town, did my little bit of running around, came back a half hour later. Coming up the hill, he wasn't there, but as I got closer to um, our road, to turn onto our road, I saw this young man walking on the side of the road. And I drove slowly by him, and I just was glancing to see and he was crying, and he was so cold. I pulled over, and I rolled my window down, and I asked him, What are you doing out here? And he had tears pouring down his face, and his face was so red, and he said he was so cold. And I says, Where are you going? Are you, who's coming to pick you up? He said he was trying to get out to Dog Creek. Well, any of you that know, to get out to Dog Creek is an hour's drive by vehicle, let alone walking. And you know what the temperatures were? It was minus 30 yesterday. And I'd said to this young man, I says, well, listen, you know what? You cannot be out here. You must come with me. I live over here. I've got a wood stove. You have to come. And I've got to get you warmed up, and then we'll figure out the rest. I'd asked him what happened, what was going on. He had just been kicked out of his home. In minus 30 weather, he had walked for at least three hours in the cold. I know the Lord had impressed me to stop, because if I wouldn't have stopped, I don't know what would have happened to this young man. We brought him into our home. We put him in front of the fire. He sobbed and he sobbed. He couldn't feel his limbs. He was so cold. He was not only physically hurt, he was emotionally broken. So Mark and I did what we could. We got him all warmed up and fed and warm clothes and um, had it arranged. There was someone that we could take him to that was a safe place for him. I don't want to go into the details. I just want to share that it is real. There are hurting people out there. We need to pick up a phone. We need to call someone. Let's stay connected as a church family. Let's reach out to the community wherever and however we can. God is coming soon. Let's press together, press together, press together. I want to close with this scripture from Hebrews 10. 24 and 25. It's paraphrased, but it's so fitting. Let us be concerned for one another. Show love and do good things. Let us not give up the habit of meeting people 
where they are at. Instead, we must continue to encourage each other even more as we see the second coming of Jesus fast approaching. We will be bringing you another update in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, God bless each and every one of you, and may you have a blessed Family Day weekend. My brothers and sisters in the Lord, I miss you so much. I miss your wonderful smiles. I miss your hugs. I miss you, your encouragement and just knowing when I go to church and you're sitting beside me. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And we are still one today. We may not be able to gather at church, but we can gather in our hearts and minds as we remember one another and pray for one another. God is a God of answered prayer and he will strengthen us. He's promised I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And although we feel isolated and anxious at times, he has also said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm so thankful for the few calls I've had from my church family that helped me to feel uplifted and my heart sings with joy when I hear your voices. I send you my love and my prayers. And I send you the joy of salvation, knowing that God is faithful right to the end. Thank you so much. So for keeping us up to date on what's happening within our church and our community. I was also very pleased to visit Margie, uh, Maggie Burgess this week, and her words were, were very encouraging. And I hope you were also touched by her words to continue to pray for each other, continue to uplift each other in prayer, and also to continue to connect to each other. Although we're not currently being able to see each other here at church, we do are able to uplift each other in prayer, get, grab a phone and call them, send them an email, send them a, send them a text message, but dedicate time throughout the week to reach at least five people, five people throughout the week from our community to just share with them the love that God has given us. Today, I am very pleased to also welcome my wife, this beautiful woman here, this is my wife, Nadia. For those of you that know her, I know you, you, you also appreciate her. For those of you who didn't know who she is, well, this is my beautiful wife. And today, since we are talking about families, we will be conducting this service together. This is going to be more of a conversation and also sharing some insights, some points of views 
of what we understand as what it means to build families together. So I pray that God will use us and God will touch your heart, that he will talk to you directly. Before we start, as we usually do, I want you to pray to God that he will tell you what you need to hear. This important message is not just for those who are married. Please don't turn off the TV, don't go to another place because you might say, well, I'm not married. This is for everyone. Whether you're a son, a daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter, if you have nephews, if you're single, if you're divorced, if you're a widow, this is for you because all of us ultimately belong to the family of God and we are building his kingdom today. So I encourage you to stay with us. I encourage you to get your book and take some notes, but I also want you to pray. I want you to pray that God will talk to you directly. We came to this meeting today. We came to this worship not to see a couple of people up here at the pulpit. You came to see Jesus, and that's our ultimate goal. That's our prayer. That's our desire. And I want you to please come with us, and let's pray together. So as we start this message, we will be able to see a glimpse of Jesus in our lives and in our families. So let's bow our heads down and, and pray now. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for giving us this blessed Sabbath to come and worship you. Wherever we are, at home, we will be at, at work, even watching this live transmission. We ask that you can touch each and every one of us here, everyone present, everyone far away, that we may together come as one, as a family of Christ, to give thanks to you for all the wonders you do in our lives. And may this Sabbath also bring us joy and peace, knowing that as we build our families together, we can also see each other in heaven one day. And that is our ultimate goal. So bless us in this day, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, our message today is found in the book of Nehemiah. And I want you to open your Bible to the book of Nehemiah because that's where we're going to see such encouraging words by the prophet of God. Now, something is happening in the previous or the first chapters of Nehemiah. And, and maybe we can discuss a little bit of who Nehemiah was and what was he doing at the king's palace. Well, the Bible opens up by saying that Nehemiah was one of those young guys who was taken as a slave into a foreign country. And as he went to that place, we probably heard about not only Nehemiah, we also heard about Daniel and his, brother, uh, and his uh, friends. friends. They were also taken to a different country, to Babylon in this case. Nehemiah, in this, in this case, he was taken to Persia. And as he was in this country, it seems that he was an outstanding gentleman, a young guy who was responsible at work, who was very eager to serve and to use his talents for the greater good. We know that it was not only him or the four uh, 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 Hebrew kids that were taken to Babylon. In fact, we know about a thousands of people, more than 10,000 people were taken, but only these names are recorded. Interesting to know that. But what was Nehemiah's job, Nadia? Do you remember what was he doing in the palace? Yes, like you mentioned, he was a young man who was very well um, looked upon in the Persian Empire, so well that he became the cupbearer for the king. So he had a very close relationship with the king of Persia. Definitely. He must have been very trusted mm -hmm. in order for him to bring him the drink. Mm -hmm. I mean, you won't put just anyone there in that position. You have to know and you have to definitely trust the person who's bringing you something to drink on a regular basis. But it seems that Nehemiah, as he is now in this position and in this place, his brother came to visit him to the capital, to the citadel. He came to visit him. And when his brother came, the first question he asked is, how is our family doing back home? How is our country doing back home? How is our city doing? And yeah. what was the result of that response? Well, it was very heartbreaking for, for Nehemiah because to hear that the city was still in crumbles, the city was having walls that were torn and, and the, also the temple was also burned down. And hearing that the people were still struggling, that really broke Nehemiah's heart. Well, of course he was a patriot. Of course he knew that they were the, the people of God, the chosen ones. And currently, they were basically 
in crumbles, as you mentioned. And, and the Bible says that Nehemiah's face Fell. felt depressed. Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you get excited when you hear that your loved ones are going through such a struggle? How are we to get happy when we know that our family, our loved ones, our kids, our nephews, our cousins, the kids that we grew up playing with, they don't have a place to live. And these are the current conditions that Nehemiah is facing. His face basically fell down. His spirits went down. Well, something interesting happened there, Nighty. He, he went on to the palace as he was still doing his responsible work. He was still serving. But when he presented himself before the king, what was the king's response to him? Well, here's this wonderful way that the, the, the relationship here, I was saying that, that Nehemiah had with the king, we see it uh, in the Bible as well because here comes the king and he asks Nehemiah, you know, what is wrong with you? Are you okay? You, you seem sad. Your face is, is sad. And when he sees that Nehemiah is still looking down, looking very upset, then the king tells him, well, this is not something just ordinary. This is actually something very grave. This is from the heart. This is like a breaking of heart. And it was so insightful for the king to see this. Something that right now, you know, that Cheryl also mentioned, how sometimes we don't look around us, what's happening around us. We only sometimes focus on ourselves, focus on how I'm feeling, how what I'm doing, and we forget to look at the, our neighbor. We forget to look at our loved one or a family member and see, hey, how are you doing? Take that time to also say, are you feeling good? Um, I see that maybe you're not today. What can I do to help you? And this is what the king did in this case. He was able to look past just the face of Nehemiah, but actually touch his heart and be like, Tell me what is in your heart, what is troubling you, so I can help you as well. I would like to see to, to read this part. I'm talking about Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 2. Therefore, the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. Of course, the, the king wouldn't have somebody next to him who was sad. Mm -hmm. It was actually a penalty of that, bringing sorrowness to the king's heart. Because we are supposed to have this gentleman here with a positive spirit all the time. But let's be real. Mm -hmm. Every one of us go through processes and moments in life when even smiling hurts. Mm -hmm. And current conditions probably wouldn't be... It, it, worse or, or, or it probably will bring us the perfect storm for us to feel sorrow in current times. In fact, not being able to see each other's face sometimes, wearing a mask. When you see somebody and you greet them and you say, how you doing today? You hardly know if they're smiling or if they're just quiet and sad. And, and that's the very situation we are living on today. But we are out to pray for those that we come and encounter with so we are able to go over the mask over that phase that we tend to put. Mm -hmm. Usually, out of respect, we all say when somebody asks us, how are you doing today? Oh, fine. We say, we are fine. Is that really what is happening in our hearts? Not very. Do I often care exactly to hear what you have to say? Probably not. Probably I'm just asking because that's courtesy, courtesy. man. It's just courtesy, you know, just to say, how are you doing today? But I think our current conditions give us the opportunity to reflect a little bit more on this. Mm -hmm. Because when we are to ask someone how they're doing, we also should put our agenda aside, our cell phones aside, and just take the time to listen. Do we build families like this? Could this be a process of building a family together? Definitely. How often do we take time to listen to each other? How often do we take time to eat with each other? To listen to our kids? What would you say about that? It's hard how you mentioned in a time and era where media takes up a lot of our, our moments, our, our time. So it, it's very important that even when we feel like we don't have that time to do it, we have to take that time. This is where it comes to actually fighting for your family or building your family or working with your families, with your loved ones. It doesn't only have to be your children. It can be aunts and uncles, grandpas, grandmas to take that little even two, three minutes of your day and just be able to call them and them a message or even just a little picture, a little something that shows them, hi, you know, I'm thinking of you today. Just yesterday, I was able to call one of my friends that I hadn't spoken in a long time, probably a couple of years, and I, it was just a quick 
two or three minutes. Hi, how are you doing? How's it going? I'm glad I was able to reach you today. I hope you have a great day and hang up. And right before bedtime, she sent me a message saying, you know, you totally made my day. I, just hearing you, uh, your voice was was my highlight of the day and I'm so thankful to have you as a friend. You know, and that was amazing, that was beautiful because sometimes we don't know how we are impacting others just by a quick message, a voice, more than anything, because sometimes hearing or reading something, it's, it's something, but you don't get to hear the actual emotion until you hear the voice. And I think that's much more important in our day. I tell you, it's, it's, it's the era of high communications, media, mm -hmm. and how much we do not communicate to each other on our daily basis. Well, the Bible says that when he talked to the king, he said, well, king, the reason why I'm like this, the condition why I'm feeling so sad and, and I have sorrow in my heart is because my city is completely destroyed. The, the, the wall, it's falling. Uh, my people don't have a leadership to take on. No one there is directing them. And the king, when he listened to Nehemiah, the next thing he says is, what do you want me to do? What would you like to be done? The king now listens to Nehemiah, and, and, and I love it because the Bible says that Nehemiah prayed to God. In those matter of seconds, he said, Lord, help me so I may come up with a plan that I can tell the king what it needs to be done. So he says, I need to go over there and evaluate, assess the needs. I need to go and make an evaluation of what needs to be done. The king said to him, not only I'm going to send you, but I'm going to send a guard with you and letters to the different people's uh, territories as you're going to cross. So they will open up their doors for you and they will respect you because you're going on my behalf. Don't we have an almighty God that is able to do more than we could ever dream of? Oftentimes we're praying for small things to happen and God is there telling us, tell me exactly what you want me to do for you. And when it comes to families, oftentimes we just stay with the less or with the minimum. And, and we're not waiting to see bigger things, but God is willing to do those things for you and for me. The story keeps on saying that he gets to the city, he starts understanding the needs, and he starts organizing the families. He starts organizing everyone to start working is it important for us to organize ourselves at home, in our families? Very important. It's, I think, one of the basis foundations of how your family works, how, what they do, or how they go about uh, whenever they need to go into a certain situation, it comes all with organization. Since small, you teach your children, okay, you wake up, you clean, you do your bed, you brush your teeth, you, do, you know, you try to show them points and steps to do, for them, for when they get older, it'll be easier for, the, for them as well. And this is a part of organization, how you plan out your day, then you can get more done throughout it, right? And that's how often do we say it's because we don't have time for anything. It's because we are too busy. It's because what we want to do is way too big for us to accomplish right now. We'll wait probably next year, and we keep on postponing and postponing things that we should be working on today. But it requires organization. And that's a key word. You should write this down. Organize your families. Pray that God will help you. But as you pray, there is something we are out to do as well. And the first item or the first areas that we start seeing glimpses of how can we build families together, according to Nehemiah, is praying to God, depending on him, but also organizing ourselves for it. And now, yeah, the, the, the story says that as they tried to now organize themselves and they started to work, things started coming up to them. Other mm -hmm. tribes, other leaders went and saw what they were doing. Because it's funny, when we're not doing anything with our families, nobody cares. Nobody pays attention. But as soon as they see you having some, some sort of happiness, some sort of excitement, there are things happening at home, what do we get from the world? 
most of the time, unfortunately, because we are human beings, we get instead criticisms. We get instead, oh, look downs. Oh, well, they're that because they're doing this, this, and that. You know, it's never something to help uplift us as well. You know, it's mostly all the time something to make you be like less than them. A person's always going to want to try to bring themselves up, right, instead of bringing others up. So unfortunately, that's what we see in our, situ in, in our day in life and in our environment. I want to read what the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7. Because this is important for us to listen, right? Number one, you need to know that as you're trying to build your family together, it's not just the task of working to build it. But you have to know that there will be an enemy that is willing to take it down as soon as you put the first block up. What Nadia was saying, people are willing, are happy to take us down. I mean, if we are suffering, if we are crying, if we are divorcing ourselves, if we are splitting apart, everybody seems to be okay with it. Well, that's part of life. Well, that's how it goes. I mean, it, it, it was out to happen. I mean, things don't last, at, at least not any longer. I mean, those days where people were to stay together for life are completely gone. Now it's about replacing. Now it's about experiencing. Upgrading. Upgrading. You know. But when we say, you know, we want to build, we want to build to last, we want to establish something that will hold, it seems that people just cross their hands and say, well, let me, let me make sure they're real, because it seems that they're fake. It seems that they're not that great, you know? I mean, they have their faults, just like anybody else, and of course they do. Of course. But is it our job to be judging? The Bible says that when... Nehemiah with the people that started rebuilding the wall, something happened. Now it happened, chapter 4, verse 7 of Nehemiah, and it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being to be closed, were beginning to be closed, they became very angry. Hmm. Have you ever experienced that you're trying to do something good for your family and someone, I don't know, just gets angry for it? Yes. Oh, we have a lot of uh, experiences that we've seen or that we've even experienced ourselves in this area. You know, um, I can easily say one when we first got married and we had to take a decision of, okay, where are we going to live? What are we going to do? We were separated. You were in uh, one country. I was in another. Where can we be together? Okay, well, Mexico. Let's get together in Mexico and be together and start our family. And I remember my family got a little bit angry at that. They're, how come? You have to change your whole life to go and be with someone or this and that and all these different things. And instead of having that support that you wish you had or that kind of like, oh, go for it. I know I'll be praying for you. Like I, like I mentioned, the human side of us automatically tries to see the negative part of it. And we have to cross through those in, in many aspects, sometimes even ignore those heating words, those heated words, knowing that we put our lives in God's for, hands first, foremost, and not wondering what others are going to talk about or say about, but first concentrate on God and concentrate on each other. I want to be clear on this. You know, we respect our parents. Yeah. We, we know they love us. We know we have a circle around us, that they care for us, they care for you. But ultimately, the family that you're building together needs to stand on what God says. You see verse 8 on chapter 4, it says, And all of them, all of them conspired together. See, it's not about just coming together to build a family. It also takes time for them to come together and to destroy it. Have you ever felt like there is a conspiracy to try to break down your marriage? Have you ever felt like there is a conspiracy against your kids, your grandkids? Because you say, well, we'll pray and we'll go this way. And as soon as you turn around, things are going completely the opposite. Have you ever felt like that? These are the conditions that the people of God are seeing. They were conspired. They, they all came together, conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. 
And this is an important word. Mm. Are families being confused today? Right and left. Are we seeing confusion in our current days? I mean, is there a conspiracy against families in current times? That we are definitely seeing left and right confusion here and there? It seems that we are in those days where good is called evil and evil is called good. And let me tell you, if you're struggling at home right now with your family, you're not the only one. Because there is an enemy who's creating confusion, who's conspiring against your territory, against your home. You know, I love Canada because this is the first time I've heard that there was a family day <laughs> to be celebrated. This is, this is the first time I, I, I've been to different countries, but I don't think I have ever heard of a family day in other places that is known not only by, by the community, but it's also established as a holy day. Mm -hmm. and, and what a beautiful day to remember that we are to work together as families. Now we're going to get to the main point this morning. Nehemiah is trying to build the wall, but not only is he struggling with the elements, weather, materials, economic issues, but now he's also struggling with a group of people who are seeing their success, and as soon, soon as they're seeing their success, they're trying to destroy it. There we hear the beautiful words that Nehemiah shares with us. And I want you to pay close attention to them. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. Can you read it, Nadia, so we all can listen? Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. It says, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Praise the Lord. The message that we get is straight out from Nehemiah. Number one, he leads himself to the leaders. He directs his speech to the ones who are running, who are leading, who, who are responsible. But the first item that we want to talk this morning, do not be afraid. Afraid. Do not be afraid. Fear. Mm. What can fear cause? Fear, as in other words, is an inhibitor of growth. Fear is what holds us back from moving forward. Interesting. Are we seeing fear in today's society? Are we seeing people afraid in today's time? Definitely. Let me tell you, we are in a current crisis. And the first thing that we are reminded is, do not be afraid. Our families shouldn't be afraid. But there is an enemy who's currently sending us messages from left to right so we can be afraid. Now, Am I able to show love when I am afraid? It's very hard. Actually, love gets lost in the translation of fear, of being afraid. Because what happens when someone is fearful of losing someone else, we hold on so tight that it does the opposite, right? Instead, the person's going to rock away or, or go away or find another um, person that can give them that just freedom of love, freedom of life. And so fear, what does to, to relationships, instead of helping it grow, it makes it separate. It makes it look for something else. I want to read what John the Apostle, the, the Apostle of Love, mm -hmm. talks about in 1st of John 4, 4, 18. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Ultimately, what he's saying is, when we have relationships that are found or, or, or built up on fear, you know, I, I might be able to manipulate you. I, I might be able to manipulate my kids out of fear. 
And I might be able to tell them, if you do this, this is going to be a consequence, so therefore, don't do it. And they will listen. Because fear, it's also a, a, a conduit to make people do things. Mm -hmm. Let's not get, uh, uh, let's not get out, of, out of context here, but if we are talking about fear, how many times do we try to manipulate our, 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 our partner just so they, so they can do what we want them to do? How many times do we try to manipulate our parents saying, well, if you don't do what I'm telling you, I'm leaving the house. I, I'm, I'm leaving this place. I'm not going to stay under you. But what ultimately do we know by fear? Is a fear the greatest way to achieve our goals? Definitely not. And it's in our Bible, it says right away what you just wrote, read, that instead of, of being able to find that love, fear will cast it away, will make it go away. So what do we have to do in that aspect? How can we not have fear anymore? How can we let that fear go away? You know, in, uh, in our beginning of our marriage, I, I believe I struggled with this in this aspect where I was afraid to express my emotions or to show, you know, my husband how, uh, what things I thought about this or, or even to do something myself, do a project for myself. And fear held me back from doing so much that when I look back now, I'm like, oh, if I would have only taken a leap of faith or if I only would have, you know, trusted more in, either in my husband or in my God, it, things could have been different. Things could have been probably a little bit better. Not saying that it, things weren't great. You know, we worked it all together. But fear was what held me back in growing as a person to the point that eventually I had to let go of that fear and be able to trust God more and saying, Lord, help me become dependent in you so anything I do can be for your glory. And only when why in this in, in talking about us personally in our relationship when I decided to put that fear aside is that I saw our marriage start to blossom more, start to grow more, saw how my husband started to love me more, or at least I felt him loving me more and me being able to love more as well. It, it, it's so interesting, uh, church, family, uh, young couples, anyone who's out there listening today, when you are leading your relationships based on fear, there are so many things you will never do. For instance, I'm not gonna tell her how much I love her because what if she takes advantage of me? Mm -hmm. Or I'm not gonna make the first step. Why am I, why do I have to be the grown up here and, and ask for forgiveness? She can do it too. Mm -hmm. Fear can cause all these problems that are easy, avoidable, if we are able to rely and, uh, and depend completely on God. Remember, ultimately, love is a decision. Okay. Fear, it's also an emotion. Mm -hmm. Love is, I might be afraid because I probably don't know exactly what the future is holding. I might not be completely clear what's coming tomorrow, but I am deciding today to love you no matter what. Because it's a decision that I'm taking. But I'm not feeling like it, Pastor. Well, it's not about what you feel. It's about what you decide and you need to decide to step away from fear because fear will never, hold, will never give you the full expression of what love is. Do not be afraid. First thing Nehemiah said to the people. Second thing, and we're about to finish. Please stay with us because we're getting close to the, to, the, to the climax of this. Climax of this. The second thing he says, do not be afraid, number one. And number two, remember the Lord. See, when, when we get afraid, we forget who the Lord is. When we are afraid, we are only seeing the big problems we have at home, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And we're only letting our emotions control us. You know, fear is an emotion, as you mentioned. So we block ourselves from actually seeing what's on the other side of that wall. I tell you, when we are afraid, we see the bills and we are like, whoa, there's nothing I can do about this bill. There's nothing I can do about this report. There's nothing I can do about work. There's nothing I can do about my daughter, my son. I need you to now, today, please remember who the Lord is. You need to be reminded again. Number of times in the Old Testament, we hear God talking to Moses saying, do not be afraid, Moses, I'm going to be with you. We, we hear about God talking to Joshua saying, Joshua, just be courageous, be brave, do not be afraid, because just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. 
When God presents himself before Gideon, the first thing he says is, you mighty men of valor. Somehow God sees us as people who are able to overcome. It's only you and me sometimes that don't believe it. But now, the next thing that Nehemiah tells his people is, you need to remember who the Lord is. Mm -hmm. What happens when we forget the Lord? Hmm. Nothing in our life goes right. You know, if our basis, our foundation of building families together is love, as we say it, then who is our greatest example of love but God himself? And if we forget that God is there, then what is holding us together? That's true. I mean, when I forget that my marriage works because God is in the midst, I tend to start taking the reins on my hands, and I tell you, they'll go completely astray. Mm -hmm. I'll go in every other direction but the right one. And sometimes we are forgetting that the only reason we have our family and, and, and a blessing in them is because God was the one who blessed it with. But when we forget, and we somehow like to take the control, you know, we like to lead, we like to say where we're going. We might work for a good, probably a few months, maybe a few weeks, maybe a year or two, but eventually things don't seem to make sense anymore. Things don't seem to be, to, to be there. What, what happens when we don't acknowledge God in our families? I believe this is the first thing Satan wants to do in our homes. He wants us to forget who the Lord is. You need to be reminded today, God is working on your behalf. God is working for your benefit. God is working for your children. God is doing everything in his power for you to be safe. But you need to remind yourself and you need to remember you're not alone. You will never get this done on your own. And I tell you, Nadia and I have a lot of experiences where we thought we knew what to do. Just recently, Nadia was telling me, why do kids tend to believe they know more than their parents? <laughs> you want to share a little bit of what happened that day? Yes, I have my daughter, Sophia. She's five years old, and um, she is a very smart, witty little girl. They, um, I keep telling myself, I always tell her, sometimes I feel like I have a teenager instead of a five-year-old. The, the answers she gives me or the comments she says. But recently, we've been having a little struggle with home with where I ask them to do something and or tell them something and she'll be like, oh no, I don't need to. Or no, it's not because of that, it's, it's because of this, you know, and having always an answer to it, as in like, mommy, I know more. And so I, one day I told her, I'm like, listen, Sophia, mommy tells you to put on a hat because it's cold outside and I know you need it, one, because I don't want you to get sick, two, because mommy already lived cold before. Mommy has many more years than you, and so you, in order for you not to get cold, not to, your ears not to get you know, frozen or anything, you need to listen to mommy, because mommy knows already. She already experienced it, and I don't want you to go through the same troubles. So I'm trying to help you out. And I think in a way, until I, I told her this, and I said, you know, you have to also listen to someone else who, who probably knows a little bit more, or that is trying the best to help you, well, you also, you know, listen and be able to <laughs> learn from that as well. Through that, and how often do we forget that the Lord loves us, that He is there to care for us, that He is there to support us. God, when He wants to come into your family life, is not to judge it, is not to destroy it, is not to, to, to criticize it. That's the work of those enemies who are trying to uh, to have a conspiracy against your home. God, in fact, is the one who's wanting to work and give you the solutions you need. Please think of that. The next thing that the verse says is, remember the Lord, great and awesome. Mm -hmm. We have a Lord who's not only great, but he's also awesome. God is good. And, and we need to know this because sometimes we've been listening to a wrong story. Somebody's been telling us a different story, Nadia, that if we allow God into our marriage, our marriage is not going to work. Who said that? Where did you listen to that? When you have God in the center of a couple, I tell you, there's no better way to live your life happily. Our God is great. Our God is awesome. And I tell you, the only reason why we are here today 
is because of that God who's great and awesome. I want you to please be reminded today, your God is great. Your God is awesome. Yes, we're seeing these tribes coming to say, even if a fox was to stand on top of one of those blocks, it will not even hold. It will fall down. How many people are telling you right now, how many posts, how many uh, experiences, and the culture is telling you, even if you try to keep your family together, there is no way that's going to happen. Well, let me tell you, our God is great and our God is awesome. He can do that with your kids. He can do that with your parents. He can do that with your loved ones. And I'm not tired of saying this because I've seen it in my family. We're seeing it in our families too. And the last part that we want to share with you this morning. The verse says, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. And number three, fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Hey, listen. It's not about not just not being afraid. It's not about just remembering who the, the Lord is, who's great and awesome, but it's also taking action. Mm -hmm. What actions are we out to take now, Nadia? A verb that's, that brings us to movement. You know, that's what it is. Action is a movement. And sometimes out of fear, out of what would people say with this, we freeze up and we forget to remember God. We have the most powerful, amazing person on our side, yet what can I do as well to help my family, to grow my family, to build my family. You know, and it, it's interesting how we mentioned that in all these other uh, Bible characters where, you know, Moses, uh, Joshua, Gideon, God said, you know, don't be afraid, be still and look at me. Look how I will work for you. He said to, to them that, and it's true, it happened. He opened the Red Sea, you know, he, he gave Gideon the army and, and the battles were won. But in so many other parts of the Bible as well, God tells his people that they have to do something. And even Jesus himself, when he came to earth and he was giving miracles to the people, he didn't just say, you're healed and that's it. He would say, extend your hand, go to the pool and wash yourself, you know, walk, get up and walk. These were actions that God was telling his people, you have to also do something in order to see the power of God working in your life. Wow. And, and, and how powerful this is, you know, it's, we often complain, our government, our church, our school, our community, uh, the culture, we complain so much about how everything is going sideways and how nothing is happening in the right order. But let me tell you, it is time for us to stop complaining and it is time for us to take action. No one is going to come and solve our church needs unless you and me get to work. How are they going to know about this great and awesome God unless you and I go out to tell them? How my kids will know how much I love them unless I take the time to hug them and kiss them? You see, we want kids to be loyal, to be faithful, to be obedient, to be courteous. How much time am I taking to spend with them during the weekly basis? I want my wife to love her, but I don't dedicate time to her. Does that make sense? I, I want her to be okay, to be happy, to, to, be, to be blossoming here, but I'm not spending time with her. I'm not listening to her. Or vice versa. The wife can also be super busy and not spending time for the husband. It's, it's a mutual kind of growth that you have to do together. I, I like the word Nehemiah uses, Nadia. Fight. Mm -hmm. This is not a, a, a passive word. This is not a, 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 a type of work that you just stay there, cross your legs, and we'll, we'll see what the Lord says. Fight means you got to take up an armor. Get ready because you are in a war. Are we in a war right now? Oh, definitely. Are we in a crisis today? Yes, are we seeing people dying out of depression? Are we seeing families splitting up because they don't know how to stay together? Are we seeing current conditions like nowhere before where people are not even understanding, although they have the time to be at home, they're staying at home, but they are socially distant because not only isolation is happening between physical distancing, but also our hearts are starting to depart from each other. Isn't that the conditions we're seeing today? 
what the Lord says, get ready to fight. I'm going to be with you, but you need to put your armor on. And I want to read what Ephesians chapter 6 says about this. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, Paul talks about the great war that we are waging right now, that we are going into. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against a spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, our fight not, is not as Nehemiah's fight that he was building and somebody wanted to destroy whatever he was putting up on the wall. Our fight, it's a spiritual fight. The moment we decide to pray together, that's the moment everybody calls. The moment we decide to fast and to dedicate time to our children, that's the moment that everything goes to, to a different way. We are currently fighting for survival. And the only way we can have a, 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 a standpoint against our enemy is not with your tools, is not with your experience, is not with what you believe is right, is not what Dr. Phil tells you, is not what Oprah says, it's about what God is telling us to do in today's time. And the Bible says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done it all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your ways with the truth, having put on the brass, uh, breastplate of righteousness, and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the furry darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let me tell you, even Canada is telling us that there is a family day. I mean, the government is telling us, hey, listen, stop on your agendas, think a little bit, reflect a little bit. There is one item in your life that you should not let go, you should not pass over, you should not oversee, and that's family. If our families are strong, what's the result of it? We will make things happen. We will change our communities around us. If our families are strong, our church is strong because at the end, our, our church is family. It's, comp it's compounded of many families. So when we come together, when we work for our families, we're also working for the growth of our church. I tell you, Satan knows that if our families start fighting, things can happen in this town. Things can happen there in Quenel. Things can happen in our communities. If you and me stop being afraid, and we are to remember who the Lord is, it's a great and awesome God. And then after knowing who He is, having that connection, that relationship, that acknowledgement of who God is in my life, now I take the stand to say I'm going to fight for my family. Maybe my family is not following right now. Maybe my kids are completely in another way, in another level, in another thought. Maybe they are far from here. Maybe they're not even with us anymore. Maybe my wife is not with me anymore. Maybe my parents are not there to, to be with me right now. But I do not care about who is and who is not. I decide to take a stand to fight for my loved ones. My brethren, my sister, my sons, my daughter, my wife, I decide to take a stand today before the Lord of hosts, saying, Lord, I want to fight, but I do not want to fight on my own, and I do not want to fight with my own tools. I want to fight with the right tools that you're giving me, your word, your spirit, the salvation of the gospel. I want to fight according to the ways you want me to fight. I tell you, things can happen in this place. I've told the church, if our families are well, everything else well. runs well. Even our government is <laughs> well. Our community are well. I tell you, 
It is our duty to now take our stand. Brothers and sisters, we are facing a crisis. And I'm not talking about a virus. I'm talking the crisis that is coming to our homes right now. There is an enemy who's wanting to destroy us all. And he knows that if he's to destroy the nucleus of society, which is family, he's going to take everything down. I encourage you, fight. But please, fight according to the Lord's way. Even Jesus said, God said, nor by your mind, nor by an army, but with my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It is not with your intentions. It is not with your ways of knowing things. It is with God's blessing that we can actually do this. But what happens if my marriage is already going down the pipe? What happens if my kids are not listening to me right now? What should I do? What can someone do right now? If this is their condition, if this is your situation, what can you do? One thing, as we mentioned, can never forget our Lord. We have to pray. And this is one of the best ways that we can get together, connect to our holy, to the God of, of, of the world, it's through prayer, being able to pray for one another, being able to pray for our loved ones, being able to pray for our church, for our community, for those we don't even know as well, because that's the biggest power we have as humans to connect to our Lord and to connect to others. I remember this saying that, that kind of goes like, dead fish go with the current floating. Are the alive ones, the alive fish, are the ones that swim against the current. The current in, 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 in our day time are telling us that probably family is something of the past. Mm -hmm. Probably family is not something that we should encourage anymore. They are bound to break, they are bound to fail. But we know our mighty God is giving us opportunity today to show the world a different message. Even if our small families were to come together, I tell you, there will be a greater sermon being preached from those families than some, someone standing here in the pulpit. So I want to encourage you today, and here we have a challenge for you. This is not just specifically for people who are married. Please don't get us wrong with this. This is about us sharing love with our family and with our community family. Our church ultimately is the greatest family we could find in this earth. Today, we have something here prepared for our church family. What is it, Nadia? Can you explain to us what these are? Well, we are so um, happy to be able to share this love with each other. And we would like to invite each and every one of you, or those who can, or are close by that can also come, uh, pick up a special card that we have for you. It's a beautiful Valentine's card for your loved ones, for your, be your son, your daughter, your wife, your husband, um, grandparents. Please come. We have enough for you to take a card as well as a rose. And you can give it to that person that you want to share God's love with them. This card is not merely Valentine's. It's a family card. And we want to share it with those that we love. Maybe you have a friend who haven't, you haven't been able to see lately. Maybe you have a, a, a partner that you used to walk with on, on, on the on the trail there at Scott Island. Maybe you have a, a loved one that currently you're not able to chat with. Well, you can come by the church, pick this up. They are uniquely made. You won't find two cards of the same. They were handmade and craftily made specifically for this event. So these are beautiful cards that you'll get. And you'll get a rose. So the idea is for us to dedicate this afternoon, maybe tomorrow if you can't do it today, but I want you to come to the church as soon as possible. Richard is going to stay here until 2 o'clock, 2.30 max, but he's going to be here waiting for those who can come so you can come and grab one card and one rose. And our challenge for today and family day weekend is for us to take the time to go to another family, to go to another person that we know in our community, to go to a friend and tell them, hey, 
We love you. We care for you. We are praying for you. Yes, we're not able to socially be together, but we're able to emotionally connect. So we want to tell you that Jesus loves you, and we also love you as well. How many of you would like to, to do this for your loved one, even for your wife, for those of you who haven't got anything ready yet, or your parents, or your daughter, or your son, or your grandparents? Whoever is there that you would like to share, we only have a few. And when I'm talking about a few, I'm talking about a good number, but it's only going to be there until items last. So please, first come, first serve. I know it's a little challenging right now. It's cold to get out, but I think this is worth it. I think it's very worth it for me to go home tonight and say, honey, God getting the help from the church, I was able to get something for you. This is I want to call fighting for taking action this is fighting for <laughs> your family action engaging in this process so we want to tell you church enjoy your family weekend and when I say enjoy your family weekend I'm not just saying to stay on the couch but I'm saying do something with your family something productive Something that tells your kids how much you love them. Something that tells your parents how much you care for them. Even if it's necessary, take the phone and make that phone call that you've been, you've been dragging on to make. And just say, you know what? I do not care what you say or what you believe. I just want to tell you I love you. I am willing to fight for you. Whether you want me to or not, I'm going to continue to pray for you. I'm going to continue to uplift you in my prayers. Tell, I tell you. God is listening and God is fighting for us. So let's have a word of prayer as we conclude tonight, today. Please share this message with your friends. Tell them that we are working for our families in our churches. We are praying for our church family. Continue to pray for those who are sick. Continue to pray for those who have lost a loved one in recent days. Continue to pray for those who currently are not able to see each other. Let's lift up our prayers to God. He is more than willing to listen and to fight for us. Let's conclude today with our prayer on behalf of our families. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we once again give you all, all the glory and give you praise for giving us our families. Thank you because you knew that we needed each other in order to keep seeing and living the love that you have for us. Through our loved ones, we were able to also see the beauty of God's love. So we ask that you may keep blessing our families, keep protecting those who need you, who seek you. May we be those uh, vessels to bring that love to them. But above all, thank you because you've given us this wonderful day, this wonderful weekend, to be able to take a moment and think about those who we want to impact in their lives, to show Christ in their lives as well. Please bless our families. Please bless our church. We ask that you may be with each and every one of us as we go on our day. But we, we always remember to, one, never let fear be an inhibitor of our growth towards you. To remember that you are the most powerful and awesome God that we have. And to fight for our loved ones, to fight for each other, so we can once more see each other in our heavenly kingdom. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 May God bless you today. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Keep, uh, keep us safe. Stay safe. And come. Come to our church. We are here. We are ready, waiting for you. We will be here until 2.30. You have enough time, 2.30, to come and pick one rose and one card so you can take it to your friend, your loved one, that person that you want to have an impact to, the ones that you're praying for. 